Hey, good morning, Family Church. It's Pastor Craig. So glad to join you this morning. We are continuing our pause in the book of Mark to focus on how to love one another, or this series we've called One Anothering. And I just want to remind you that this, this is a focus on how the body of Christ is to operate. You see, it's a, it's a training ground for the gospel to be lived out in us and through us into a hostile world. Where else can we practice loving one another if we can't love the world outside while we love the world inside the church? We've got to be well-equipped for that. So this is the focal point of how to care for one another, and there's a purpose for it, sharing the gospel. And and uh, I'm just getting back from Korea, and I have this picture. So if it's blurry on your screen, wherever you're looking at this, don't panic. That was actually intentional. I gathered with 5,000 global leaders from around the world, two, over 200 countries represented. And some of the people in this picture asked not to be sh uh, sharing the photograph. So that's why it's blurry. But I just want you to get a sense of what it's like to be in a room with 5,000 people. But it's not just, uh, you know, a gathering like a concert. This is an incredible opportunity to work side by side with people. At my table, I had people uh, who do work in, uh, in Wales, in India, who are from the Philippines, who are from Romania, and who are from, uh, you know, Southeast Asia and that region. What an incredible gathering. One little table, and then the entire collection of people that gathered, working in war-torn areas, working with sex traffic victims and helping them find healing in Christ, working frontier missions, places where the gospel has yet to penetrate, and also working in economically stable and flourishing environments. It was an incredible gathering to get together and remember that we have a common mission, and that is to make Christ known throughout the world. And that ties into this message because there's a, a presenter. He's part of the Lausanne movement. He's a CEO. His name's Michael O. And he said this at our gathering, the four most dangerous words in the church and globally as the church. The four most dangerous. I don't need you. Sadly, that is what tends to occur in the church. Often we start needing each other, but as we develop in our faith, sometimes there's a separating of a need all of a sudden. We come knowing we need Jesus often, and then we begin to depend on ourselves. And as a global church, we, we may work side by side in the same towns, and not partnering together because we're on the same mission. And so the dangerous words that I wanted to share to start us today are, I don't need you. And that, of course, is in direct opposition of our series, One Another. And the fact is, we do need each other. We have got to learn to work well together because it is for God's glory that we do that. And so I want to bring you into a, a, a study as we look at in the book of Ephesians. So this is not a, a book study. We're not going to do a verse by verse. I want to take you into chapter four of Ephesians to look at how Paul writes to us about how to operate as the body of Christ. And just a reminder for those that aren't familiar with the book of Ephesians, it's uh, you know six chapters and chapters one through three, it lays out very clearly our standing before God, where we were enemies of God, where we deserved his wrath. And yet, because of his love for us, he came down, he gave his life. Jesus came, gave his life on the cross for us, dying and rising again, defeating death and sin, and then providing for us grace. Grace to be forgiven of all of our sins, of our anger, of all the things in us that separated us from God. And in this first three chapters, we get to see the beautiful identity of what it means to be in Christ, a child of God, citizen of heaven, a guaranteed inheritance, sealed by the Holy Spirit. What a fabulous chapter to look through, one through three. But I want to bring you to chapter four because it then says, in light of, or what should our response be and our responsibility in light of the gospel? in light of the grace given to us so that no one can boast this 
incredible free gift. And so I want to take us through chapter four. I'm going to read sections, and then we're just going to hone in on a few key elements to sort of draw out the one anothering aspect of how to operate as the body and for what purpose ultimately. So this is a, a, a key reminder is I want to take you real fast. If you want to open your Bibles right now to chapter four of Ephesians, just listen for a moment to the end of chapter three, after Paul has laid out very clearly this incredible grace gift. He says this now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Say amen wherever you are. Amen. That is the key that you must hold tight. Everything we're going to walk through today is an empowering gift and possibility in Christ because of the Holy Spirit. This is an incredible opportunity for you and I to realize what God desires to do in us and will do in us if only we'll partner with the Spirit. So resist the temptation to create a, a to-do list and maybe think of it as a look at what God is going to do through me list. Just an opportunity for you to reflect that way. But let's begin in chapter four and listen carefully, follow along, and then we'll kind of tear out some of the, I think, key elements that are addressed in this text. Uh, so chapter four, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And we'll start there and draw out the first aspect for today, which is uh, we are called to walk in a worthy manner. We're called to walk in a worthy manner. This is an incredibly, under, uh, it's really important to understand. This is a call that is given with the possibility through the power of the Spirit. But look at how it says it one more time. Let's look at the text. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And let's remember from the last two weeks, this is agape love. This is an unconditional love, a self-sacrificing love. Let that echo throughout the passages today, but we're called to walk in a worthy manner. So what does that practically look like? See, as we walk in this way, it is for the purpose to not only bear with one another, which is a challenge, we are all unique, we have our failings, we're called to bear with one another, even when things don't go well or we don't agree, to bear with one another. Why, verse 3, to maintain the unity of the Spirit, of the bond of peace. This is a critically important part. And so maybe you're asking, what does it actually look like to walk in a worthy manner? And there's four things I want to draw out. I'm going to take you to a different book really quick, because when the Bible identifies for itself, when God's Word identifies his own word, we might as well look at it. So Colossians says it this way, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And there's four things I want to draw out real quick. Bearing fruit in every good work. Remember, this is the work prepared in advance for us to do, spoken of in Ephesians. To bear fruit, to, to see the fruit of the Spirit develop in us, and to bear fruit as we disciple others and proclaim the gospel. So walking in a manner worthy is there should be fruit bearing happening. Two, increasing in the knowledge of God. This happens by obviously meditating through God's word itself, but also experiencing God, seeing him as he interacts with you and the world around you, experiencing his love, experiencing forgiveness, experiencing peace and joy, increasing in the knowledge of God, not only through his word, but through just life experience as he interacts with you. The third one, it says, be in strength with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. 
So how do we walk in a manner worthy of this calling? We walk with joy even in trials and tribulations, suffering, persecution, hardship, joys of life, and sorrows. To do it with joy and patience and endurance, to endure because God says, this is how I develop you. So how do we walk in a worthy manner? With joy through our hardships, through our sufferings. And finally, the fourth one, give thanks to the Father always. In all things, constantly remind yourself, everything is a gift of God, even the very breath you just breathed right now. A gift of God, giving him thanks, even in difficult circumstances. So four things real quick, one more time. Bear fruit, not your fruit, the fruit of the Spirit in you. Expect it to happen. Walk in that truth. uh, Increasing in knowledge, always growing in the knowledge of the Lord being strengthened for endurance, but through joy, having a joyous heart, even in the endurance and patience with that. And finally, giving thanks to the Father. So so we walk in a worthy manner with God as the source of the, the possibility this can be accomplished, trusting him in all things and living out the call that he has in our life. And the second part I want to bring us back to in Ephesians is where he says this, Real simple. I mean, there's, it's a pretty gray area here, I think. He says, with all humility and all gentleness and all patient, right? Pretty gray. Uh, yeah, that, that word all is kind of a big deal. So how do we walk? How do we bear with one another? How do we get through this journey of life together and grow as the body and maintain peace? With all humility, not some. <laughs> with all gentleness and with all patience. Sadly, this is not always on display in the body. Remember, this is the training ground. This is where we learn to love people who already love God so that we can love those who don't. And sadly, we often don't do this well. In fact, I'm afraid that sometimes over the time of those who've walked long enough in the faith, sometimes what I see is those who struggle with humility and gentleness and patience, sometimes because of what they believe they've earned or learned. They look down on the younger. Or perhaps the younger look down on the older, like you've been around too long. See, this is not a directional point at either generation. This is to say that all generations should look at each other, serving and loving each other with all humility, with all gentleness, with all patience. Has your faith led you to such a place or maybe your pride led you to such a place that there is no room for anybody to speak into your life if they're younger than you or they're older than you? What does that look like for you? How are you doing with humility? How are you doing with gentleness? Even when you're sure you're right, because you've studied, whether it's a theological point or maybe it's a cultural thing that you're wrestling with or a political thing, and you're not too gentle. How's your patience? Do you ever find yourself short-tempered with perhaps New believers, young believers, expecting them to be already mature, even though for them they're in the beginning of their journey, but you're way down the road. So this is where we come together and we realize, oh yeah, as we mature, we help others mature. We don't look down on them. This is one of the difficulties I think we face as the body. And if we do it well, as the body flourishes, as we're humble, not proud, as we're gentle, not harsh, as we're patient, not demanding with one another, we not only grow together and build each other up, we become more effective for the work of gospel proclamation around the world. We need each other. See, we cannot do this alone. I do not, I don't need you. That doesn't work here. I have to work with you. I need you in my life. This is what one another is about, and it's for the bond of peace. The world is watching. I want to take you to uh, continuing on in our reading here, starting at verse 7 in chapter 4. 
It says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Once again, we're, we're looking at this building up in agape, sacrificial, unconditional love for development of the body. And so the second point today I want to press into is we are called to speak the truth in love. This is a, a key thing, and I know many of you have heard this preached on and talked about, and many of you have declared, I do speak the truth in love. <laughs> Maybe you say it in anger, but I do speak the truth in love, like I really try. Let's look at it in the text and be clear of what he says. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him. Notice that growing up piece. Notice that as it concludes, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, we are called to be the body of Christ on display for the world. Remember the training grounds? So how do we interact with each other? First, we want to make sure we understand what truth is. The book of Hebrews makes it clear. Truth is the word of God, period. The word of God is truth. It says it this way, the, the word of God is a double-edged sword. It penetrates the soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes. This is the, the purpose of God's word itself, to, to penetrate, to begin to dissect and carve out the old me so the new me can be reborn in Christ. It's a double-edged sword. But often, we take the place of the Spirit or the Word of God, I'm afraid. When we enter into the room, the room, the, the body of Christ, when we enter into relationship with one another, and we come with a heavy word of truth, without love, we only cut down frequently. Because even though our truth is righteous, our truth is clear, our truth is from God's Word, without love, when it's absent, we just cut each other down. It's kind of like this. See, Pastor Jason a few months ago brought a sword, and I thought, why not? It's my turn. I've got a sword, and this is often what we also are talked about, is we're going to be looking at how do we operate with one another. See, we enter into groups. If we enter into the room with a sword like this, it's a little bit intimidating. This, this isn't exactly the approach you want to say, hey, I have something really lovely I want to share with you. I'd like to speak to you with genuine love right now as you've got the sword high, ready to hack and slice. So I'm afraid that speaking truth of love or just speaking truth can look often like this, like here I am. And I got, I got truth for you <laughs> and you need to hear it. Not very welcoming, is it? You see, as we, uh, as we think about how we operate together, I think the scripture helps us to understand. So what does this actually look like then? And just as an example, I was, while I was in Korea at this gathering, so there's 5,000, remember, low, uh, 5,000 global leaders. These aren't, these aren't just people who kind of go to church. These are people who have poured their life out for the gospel. And they love Jesus. <laughs> and we love to proclaim the gospel. And our goal is to see the ends of the earth reached with the gospel, that all would hear and have an opportunity to receive life in Christ. And simultaneously, while 5,000 inside a building are gathered, 
outside the building, a local church was protesting against the gathering. Wait, what? Yeah, a local church was protesting against this gathering. Now, there was, there was perhaps, I know there's more cultural things going on. There's, there was some statements made. But in the very heart of it, the world didn't, did not see the, the minutia of a sentence or two that there was a disagreement on. What they saw was the church being fought by the church. This is what they saw. And why do people want to be investing in that? How, who wants to come into a body that can't wait to hack and dice each other? I was surprised, actually, when this was happening, quite frustrated, because I thought, don't they understand? Like, we're the body. We might have some theological difference. We might have some different opinions on things, but, but we're supposed to be the body, and the world is watching, and they want to know, do you really love each other? And I will say that display did not look like love. It looked like a lot of truth and an absence of love. Proverbs says it this way when it comes to one another. Iron sharpens iron and one may, as one man sharpens another. Iron sharpens iron. And so I brought also the second tool of the arsenal. This is a, a sharpening steel. Uh, not very deadly looking. I mean, you could poke somebody in the eye and thump them on the head. But if I walk into the room with this, most of you are going to be like, well, what are you going to do? If I go to a sword fight with a sharpener, they're going to think I'm part of the crew that helps establish that blades are prepared for battle. But this is how we're supposed to enter the room. So when we get into loving one another, when we get to speaking truth and love, the picture was this. See, a good filer, somebody who knows how to sharpen well, is gentle. And it's meant to improve the blade, not damage the blade. And so this is how we should enter, to build up one another. And so let me ask you this question. How do you enter the room? Do you enter the room of the church of God into the community of God like this, with all kinds of truth? Or do you enter the church into your life group, into your assembly, into relationship like this. See, it's not very threatening, and it's actually useful. It's purposeful, and we are called to do this well, to love one another, to invest in one another, to not look down on one another, to bear with one another with all patience and gentleness and kindness. As we come together to say, yeah, we, we may say some things incorrectly. We may not quite understand the theology. We may not have read that part of the Bible. We might have a different view of how we see the culture interacting. And we need to come back to the truth and discuss it from God's perspective, not mine. Let's look at it from God's perspective. And boy, if we would enter into to honing each other, wouldn't that be a better picture for the world outside watching? How do you want people at your workplace, at your school, wherever you live and work and play, how do you want them to see the kingdom of God interacting? I'll tell you that one of the graphs I saw at this Lausanne Congress was the world population on the increase, the church growth was plateaued. It wasn't keeping up with world population. I think there's some reasons for that, but I think one of them is echoed in this passage today. I think there's not been an edification, a, a honing of the body in love so that we can enter the world well and proclaim the truth of Jesus. Let's pick up on verse 17 and we'll finish the, the passage here, chapter 4 of Ephesians. Now this I say to you and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of hearts. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. 
and to put off the new self, excuse me, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. Verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. There's a big lesson there I don't want to go into today, but he's saying, look, anger, you're going to have emotion, but don't start sinning in that. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let, not the, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need and let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as it is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I don't know if you picked up on this theme, but it started with the very beginning of this passage, urging you to walk. Let's keep that perspective. Every time you read this passage, you begin to see this is a direct call to my walk, my heart, my response, and then how I can interact with others in the body to be encouraged and to encourage, to be sharpened and to sharpen. And so this is the third point is we're called to forgive like Jesus. We are called to forgive like Jesus. How in the world will we forgive our enemies in a hostile world if we can't learn to forgive those who love God and are called to love one another? We're called to forgive like Jesus. Look what it says. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. See, you were called to be a conduit of God's forgiveness, not a cul-de-sac. It's only for you. You were called to be forgiven as Christ forgave you and to learn to forgive others as Christ forgave you. And this is not a message on the complexity of forgiveness. So please extend grace right now as I want to make a point about what the call is to. And I know that forgiveness is hard and there's many processes we walk through of our own repentance of others' repentance, of learning to bear with one another in this process. But it is the call that has been placed on us to forgive as Christ forgave you. And so when you look at the passage, again, there's a lot of all statements. We are to let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, all slander to be away from you, not a part of who you are as the body now, along with all malice in case he missed something. Oh, by the way, all malice. Like some of those words you're not maybe familiar with because we don't often talk about clamor. That's like shouting at each other. You know, the bold tick, bold face, bold cap text with an exclamation mark that you text somebody in all caps. That's clamor. You know, those social sites where you think it's okay to bash somebody in the body because you're not there in person. That's clamor. Like this is what we're called to. That ties into slandering one another. We're not to slander one another. We're to put that away. As Christ works in you, as the Spirit leads you, as you are guided through the process, he says, get rid of this anger. Get rid of it. So what does it look like? And I love how he ends on verse 32. He says, if you're not sure, here's the idea. Let's not forget love, agape love. So be kind to one another. Remember, bearing with one another in gentleness, in forgiveness, in speaking truth, in agape love, bearing, being kind with one another, bearing with one another, tender hearted. Don't come in with the sword, come in with the file, ready to work together. And maybe before you start, I don't know, whittling away on somebody to hone them, you might want to ask, how are you doing today? That's the love part actually caring about who they are, not just wanting to get in attack mode. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. This is what we are called to. We have been forgiven of bitterness against God. We've been 
freed from the wrath that would have come from God. The anger that he has against sin has been removed from our life because of Christ. What a beautiful picture. And so I, I had this passage that, uh, it was a quote from this conference, this gathering. I don't remember who said it specifically, but I thought it was pretty powerful to our point today. See, forgiveness is not a sign of weakness, but a powerful and transformative choice that breaks the cycle of violence and overcomes evil with good. Just meditate on that for a moment. Forgiveness is not a sign of weakness. If you think it is, I take you to the cross. And Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus extended it even in the midst of the extreme moments of suffering. It's not a sign of weakness, but a powerful and transformative voice, choice Excuse me, that breaks the cycle of violence and overcomes evil with good. You and I can be in bondage to our unforgiveness. And we will struggle to live in peace with ourselves, with God, and with the body. But it also is something we can lord over people. It's a process. It's challenging, but it is what we are called to. And the only thing that makes it possible is because of what Christ has done for us. I want to close with why we must love one another well why we must forgive, why we must speak truth and love, why we must walk in a manner that's worthy to this calling in the power given to us by God himself. What an incredible truth we have today, but here it is. Jesus says it this way in John, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You want to be a great gospel witness in a hostile world? This is how it's accomplished. You want to have gospel impact and see the nations reached? Then we can't say, I don't need you. We have to start saying, I do need you. And I understand that we come from different backgrounds and different places, but we have one common thread. We are part of the body of Christ. And let's strive together for unity and peace so that our gospel witness here in Douglas County and across to the nations can be stronger, can be more effective, and it can be beautiful to a world that is seeking to find what we already have. I love you guys so much. I'm going to release to the campus. Hope you have a great day. And for those that are sticking around with me, man, I love this challenge because it's not like I have perfected this. I'm still on the journey. But I am working, and I have found that as God has worked in me, I have been blessed by the ability to receive forgiveness and to forgive others. I'm so grateful. So here's my challenge for you today. Just ask the question to yourself, where do you need to invite Jesus to help you in your transformation? In the removal of your old self and the putting of your new self, where are you struggling and where do you need to invite Jesus into the journey? Is it humility? Do you struggle with pride? Is it gentleness? Are you harsh? Is it patience? Are you short-tempered? Are you hostile? And is it forgiveness? Are you bitter towards others? Are you struggling to let go? I just want to encourage you to pray through this idea of, God, where can I join you in this transformative journey? There will be a part you play. And sometimes it's saying no to the emotions you desperately want to live out. But in the power of Christ, he will walk you through this.